welcome to Agility, Adaptiveness versus Resilience, uh, a conversation about how we can apply agility to help build adaptiveness and resilience in our organizations. I'm Tom Perry. I'm an Agile Transformation Consultant and Coach here in the Seattle area. I'm also the author of the Little Book of Impediments and founder of the Agile Management Northwest Conference. Uh, in general, I'm an Agilist, a Sherpa, a builder, an innovator, and someone who likes to help others with their strategy and their process. So today's topic will cover basically uh, three key points. Uh, we'll start with an overview, uh, and then we'll go into the elements of adaptiveness in agility, and then we'll cover the elements of resilience that are key to agility and then we'll wrap things up with a conclusion. So today's webinar will be relatively brief, comparatively speaking. So when we think about adaptiveness and resilience, one of the things that really comes to mind is that there's a bit of a tension between the two. Uh, on the one hand, uh, that adaptiveness, that ability to change is something that's very fundamental to agile methods in general. And yet, at the same time, there also needs to be a certain element of resistance, uh, of not changing that has to come into play, especially when we look at uh, transformation uh, and also long-term persisting agile in uh, new environments. And so with this in mind, there is a little bit of conflict and contrast. And I'm going to try and cover them uh, using similar elements, namely people, uh, process, and products. So we'll look at it from, from, from different elements. With that in mind, I think this is all in the face of what is significant disruption. And so when we talk about adaptiveness, when we talk about resilience, what we're really talking about is how do we manage and handle the inevitable disruptions that come along. And in some ways, we want to flex, and in some ways, we don't want to flex. And finding that right balance between the two is really critical when it comes to getting agility right. And so when we look at how disruption works these days, uh, oftentimes we see that disruption can come in very familiar ways like COVID-19 and the pandemic, but it can also come in other ways like um, product disruptions, ecosystem disruptions, when the economy gets, gets uh, changed dramatically, uh, social disruption, uh, there can be economic disruption, trade wars, stock market crashes. So there really are a bewildering number of ways that change can come at us. And it, it, it's really hard to uh, underestimate just how complex that ecosystem is. So with that in mind, let's take a look at adaptiveness here for a minute and ask ourselves the question, what does Agile do for us to help us behave more adaptively to adapt to change better. And so on the first front, I'd like to start with people. And we see this in organizations where organizations that are able to be agile, if you use a term like business agility, for example, those organizations would typically be organizations that can change the structure of the people in the organization quickly. And there are some prerequisites to being able to do that. If you have everyone that's highly specialized and they don't have the skills needed to do other jobs, then you don't have an adaptive organization. And so one of the prerequisites for that is that you have people who have cross-functional skill sets or at least cross-functional teams so that a team that's working on one thing can switch to working on something different. If people can't switch or if teams can't switch, then you don't have an adaptive organization. Now, on the one hand, uh, you could say, well, 
when push comes to shove, people switch quite quickly. And there are some great uh, cases where I would say, yes, they can do that. Unfortunately, it seems to be only in extremists. And so we want to create organizations that can create with less resistance uh, much more quickly. And so cross-functional teams, and also I think those teams need to be small. The larger the group that you're working with, the harder it is to behave in an adaptive fashion. And so size matters when it comes to adaptive behavior. It's, it's not impossible, but it's much, much more challenging to get an adaptive large group to change quickly and meaningfully uh, as opposed to much, much smaller groups. And so the size of the groups makes a difference when it comes to adaptive behavior. There are a couple of other um, ways of adapting that I think may be less agile in their nature. One is simply acquisition, and acquisition happens all the time in the business world. Uh, and it's used to adapt to a changing business environment where perhaps you have a choice between trying to compete, trying to innovate, or simply acquiring the competition. And so acquisition is a time-honored and well-understood way of adapting to competitive pressures. The other thing that you'll see is layoffs. And layoffs are used all the time to adapt to a negative working environment of some sort. So if the economy's taken a dive or something like that, then it's much more likely that you're going to have layoffs. Now, when you look at layoffs and how layoffs play out, they don't play out typically well for organizations in terms of the long-term health of the organization. Uh, typically what you see are organizations that lose many of their best and brightest. Um, the recent uh, uh, acquisition that took place by Broadcom over CA was a classic example where it seemed as though they almost intentionally laid off the very best and the brightest in the organization as part of that acquisition. And I would call that nothing short of one of the least agile acquisitions I've ever seen take place. It was appalling. Uh, and so I think you have to be very, very careful when you're using those tools because they are the crudest tools in your toolkit. So let's move on and talk a little bit about process. Process is really uh, an area where I think Agile has come into its own in terms of providing a set of frameworks. And when we think about frameworks, the important thing here is that a framework is not 100% prescriptive. It does not tell you what to do in every single case. Instead, what you see with frameworks are gaps. And frameworks that have gaps allow people to change things in those gaps. They don't tell you what to put into those gaps. You can put whatever you like into those. And so that enables frameworks to be flexible. Without those gaps, if frameworks are too tightly constrained, then what we find is that frameworks are not as flexible. And so my definition of a framework that is flexible is one that has more gaps or more opportunities for customization than another one. And so if you look at the processes that are out there, you see things like Scrum. And Scrum is um, very much at, the, at one end of the spectrum in terms of having just the absolute bare minimum of essential pieces in a framework necessary for it to be even called a coherent framework at all. And so you've got your, you know, your ceremonies, your planning meeting, your daily stand-up, your demo, your retrospective, and you, you don't have a whole lot else in that framework. And so the rest is up to you to develop. Kanban is perhaps even more radically simple in that Kanban really prescribes almost nothing other than that you should visualize the steps that you take and measure the steps that you take. And then beyond that, uh, the framework can go any of a, a dozen different directions. 
and doesn't uh, really mandate anything in particular. And so Kanban is probably at the furthermost extreme of processes uh, in terms of starting off with absolutely the bare minimum. And then you have frameworks that are on the other end of the spectrum that are much more prescriptive. So if you look at a framework like SAFE, for example, SAFE is applied to large organizations. And large organizations oftentimes require very robust documentation, which SAFE has. And it also is a bit more rigid because you're applying this across much, much larger audiences. And as you apply it across larger audiences, the importance of consistency tends to become much more heavily emphasized. I'm not saying it's necessarily the right thing, but one way or another, consistency and stability within those large organizations becomes a much more heavily emphasized attribute, which means that those frameworks typically have a lot more of the details filled in, so they're much more on the highly structured end of the spectrum with l fewer gaps. On the other hand, they also are highly documented and are very, very rigid, which provides a certain sense of stability, which oftentimes is necessary in larger organizations. Another example of that might be DAD, which is Disciplined Agile Development. And as the name suggests, disciplined meaning it's a bit more rigorously defined and was actually implemented as a bit of a reaction to processes like Scrum that were a little bit too loosey-goosey for the folks who came up with DAD, who felt that larger organizations required more robust documentation and required fewer gaps in the framework than what Scum, Scrum provides. So with that in mind, when we look at frameworks and we ask ourselves how adaptive are we, some frameworks come out very, very adaptive, like Kanban. Other frameworks come out not so adaptive, like SAFE and DAD. And so it varies based on what your needs are and what the pressures are that you're dealing with in your system. So that's a little bit on process. Finally, when it comes to product, the products that we have also are a reflection of the adaptive nature of our systems. And so if you look at products, you'll see that, uh, uh, for instance, products that engage in frequent pivots, frequent lots of feedback from customers, those that are pivoting are using a methodology called the Lean Startup methodology. And that is a way of engaging in really intense, close conversation with the customer about do they like this, what do they see, and, uh, and not making the assumption that these organizations necessarily know up front what it is the customer wants, but rather discovering it. And of course, uh, that's all well and good when you talk about it, but it's very hard to do. And so frequently what you see are organizations that have adopted agility, have adopted a lean startup methodology, but are still implementing uh, using very linear iteration and incrementing uh, uh, processes. And so when you see that taking place, those are organizations that have failed to understand that the iteration and the incrementing that is provided as part of agility are necessary for success. And instead, they're operating on the old sort of waterfall style, we're going to follow this path, no matter what the feedback tells us, all the way from start to finish. So you have to watch out for that. And finally, I think there's been a bit of a resurgence of innovative thinking like design thinking, which has helped to push forward this idea of empathy for the customer, understanding the needs of the customer and what the customer values in important ways so that we can change rapidly and adapt to what we discover. So that's also critically important. So we've talked about adaptiveness now along four dimensions. That is the people, the process, and the products. I'm now going to switch gears and talk a little bit about resilience.
we'll use the same framework for the dimensions that we talk about for resilience. So again, we'll focus a bit on people, process, and product when we talk about resilience, which in some ways is the exact opposite of adaptiveness. So when we look uh, at people and ask ourselves the question, how do people reflect resilience in an organization, there are a couple of things that are really necessary. First, having some sort of shared values. Um, the ability to come together with a, a, a coherent set of shared values is critical. The why you are together is important. If you don't have that, then it's very, very hard to have an organization that exhibits resilience because fundamentally you don't believe you're together for the same reasons. You need to be able to achieve consensus. And while this may sound trivial, it's definitely not. Consensus, the ability to agree with each other, to come to agreement, especially when there is conflict, is essential for organizations that need to reflect resilience. And if you are unable to agree, then you're brittle. And unfortunately, if you're brittle, you're unable to exhibit resilience. And, and so I've seen many organizations, the one thing they struggle with is that ability to come to consensus. And all too often, it's an inability for them to let go of ego and, and things like that. And they want some sort of magic wand or cure for the problem, which is that they are way too heavily invested in some different aspects of the organization, which can vary widely. Uh, but unfortunately, that can cause huge problems for organizations. And then it just takes a mutual commitment to some sort of shared goal. And that mutual commitment needs to be there. And then it becomes a lot easier for organizations to make the change that they need to make in order to be resilient. So the first thing we have to have is shared values and the ability to achieve consensus in order to arrive at some sort of mutual commitment. If we can't do that, then we fail on the people side of the equation and no amount of agility is going to help us out. On the process side of the equation, we go back to looking at our frameworks. And this is where, if we're looking for resilience, there are a couple of things to watch out for. Number one, it's frameworks that have document that are well documented and have some sort of certification behind them tend to be a bit more resilient and robust because everyone has been basically aligned and agrees on what the key elements and attributes of the framework are. If you don't have that certification, if you don't have that documentation, then it's much less likely that you're able to achieve that alignment on what the goals and the, the, ele the important elements of the framework are. And so if you can't agree on that, then you, again, you're going back to that inability to achieve consensus. So things like documentation and things like certification, I think help us to achieve consensus when it comes to conversations surrounding our process and our framework. Um, beyond that, um, I think it, it's simply a matter of how invested people are in the framework because we do find that there are differences in people's adherence to frameworks where what you see with frameworks like Scrum has been uh, an almost unwavering religious adherence to the framework, which you did not see with other frameworks like Extreme Programming or XP which certainly had people who loved it, but it was that unwavering adherence to the framework that we saw with Scrum that really led to its, its widespread adoption and ultimately uh, to its ability to uh, overwhelm XP in the marketplace. Finally, let's take a look at products. And again, for products to be resilient, the number one thing they have to do is be valued. And so there are an awful lot of products that are out there that are getting sold that aren't that valued. And so 
it's that ability to start pivoting again that's going to make a product more resilient and also that they're designed well. I think during times of crisis and times of stress, products that are not designed well tend to find their Achilles heel at that point and are unable to compete against new and more nimble competitors that are better designed. And so um, I think the thing that helps resilience the most for products comes down to have we really honed in on the value and have we designed the product well. Um, and products that are able to go after those elements are the products that are most able to succeed. At the end of the day, it's pretty apparent here you need to have multiple options. And so using strategy techniques like Wardley mapping, for example, um, can help you map the landscape and understand the forces at play for your particular organization in your particular domain. And so I like to use techniques like Wardley mapping to help paint a picture of what is needed for a given organization in a given domain with given processes and given products to figure out what's needed. And so this is one of the tools that I highly recommend. I also recommend that when we engage that we use a structured approach. We start with an initial consultation and work through uh, an idea generation workshop. Uh, we'll do some collection and visualization and review and refinement. Uh, each step of the process here is designed to make sure that you understand and own all of the outputs and outcomes that you're going to achieve along the way. And so, like with the innovation workshop, we're going to set you up to succeed so that you have what you need to take on the next step in the process. So, these are the kinds of steps I like to use when I am working with a customer and I found in the past that they've helped me to be very, very successful. If you're interested in finding out more, please check out uh, Thomas Perry LLC. Uh, that's thomasperryllc.com on the web. And there you can find workshops on business innovation, product innovation, and career innovation, as well as services, training, and coaching. Um, so check that out. Uh, and there's more content. So I've been running this YouTube uh, recording all summer long and I continue to and so you can get bite-sized chunks of good information on agile topics from the YouTube channel as well as from my blog where I occasionally publish so let's build something great if you're in business I want to help you diversify and thrive in the new normal if you're a coach I want to work with you to build new connections and help others thrive and if you're unemployed I want to help you find a new way of working. Thank you very much and have a great week.